Good afternoon and welcome to the third and final installment of Camp Prosperity 2023. Today's session is on redefining your role as an advocate, owning imposter syndrome. Before we dive on into today's conversation, we want to share a few quick housekeeping tips. This webinar is being recorded and will be available and mailed to registrants within one week. All webinar attendees are muted to ensure sound quality, but we still want you to engage. Ask a question or share your thoughts anytime by typing into the text box on your GoToWebinar control panel. And if you experience any technical difficulties, please email gotomeeting at prosperitynow.org. How do we get the most out of today's conversation? Join us from a quiet space. Grab a coffee or snack and settle in. And like I said previously, engage. Send us your questions and comments as you listen. And you can also tweet with us on Twitter using the hashtag Camp Prosperity. And finally, reflect on ways to apply what you learned today to your own work. Thank you, Justin, and welcome everyone to Camp Prosperity, our third and final session of this series. I hope that you all are, are excited to continue learning about advocacy. Uh, we started off this series, of course, talking about data two weeks ago and the important role that it plays in advocacy. And last week, we continued the series in talking about messaging and discussing some effective messaging strategies that really resonate with your legislator. And I hope that you all took a lot away from those two sessions. Uh, today, as Justin mentioned, we're going to continue the series uh, while talking about imposter syndrome. Uh, one of the ways that we sort of put together the agenda for Camp Prosperity every year is by surveying our, our members of our Prosperity Now community and saying, hey, what do you want to learn during this year's Camp Prosperity? What areas are you struggling with in advocacy? And several people wrote back and said, I always feel like an imposter when I do advocacy. I don't feel like I know what I'm talking about when I engage my legislators. I just never feel comfortable. And so we thought, why not put together a webinar session on that during Camp Prosperity to talk a little bit about imposter syndrome, what it means, how it shows up in your advocacy work, and some ways that you can overcome it. So we're really excited about this series. I'm Vanna here, as you can see there on the screen, your lead camp counselor. That's my title every summer here at Prosperity Now. But my official title is Associate Director for Advocacy. And as always, I'm happy to be with you today. Just a couple of additional housekeeping items before we get into today's conversation. Um, you all know as a part of Camp Prosperity, one of the things that, one of the ways that we always try to keep the series fun and interesting for you all is give you ways to win prizes. Everyone likes to win prizes. I know I do. I get angry when I lose in a free game of bingo. Uh, but there's several ways that you can win prizes with us here at Camp Prosperity. Um, tweet with us. If there is something that you hear from one of our speakers today that is just an awesome quote that you want to share with the world, tweet it out. Use the hashtag Camp Prosperity at the end of today's session. I'll announce our uh, social media winner for you all, um, and that person will win a small prize from Prosperity Now. Also, if you take our survey, uh, we'll, we'll draw a name from our survey takers and award a prize to one of those folks. So please fill out our survey at the end of this. Um, that's how we continue to improve Camp Prosperity is by getting feedback from you all. Um, and then lastly, our big prize that we've got this year um, is if you meet with a legislator, and in a second we'll drop that in the chat, the meeting log link, but we're encouraging everyone to meet with your legislators. We don't want Camp Prosperity to just be an advocacy series where you come and you learn and you just you know take this knowledge and do nothing with it. We want to encourage you throughout the month of August to go out and meet with your legislators, preferably your state and local legislators, uh, but federal works as well. Meet with those folks uh, on issues around housing or child wealth building or whatever issues are near and dear to you. Um, meet with those folks, fill out our meeting logger, and you'll be entered for a chance to win complimentary registration to our 2024 Prosperity Summit. For those of you who have been to our summit, you know what an incredible conference it is. So if you can get there for free, that's even better. So I encourage you all to uh, get in this contest. We're going to announce the winner in er early September. All of that information can be found in the chat for you all. So please engage, like I said, for a chance to win prizes. Um, but today we've got three incredible speakers for you all. Um, three of our state partners here at Prosperity Now um, who are doing incredible work across the country, uh, who we've invited to speak and to share 
uh, ways in which they engage in advocacy and overcome imposter syndrome. So the first is Andronika Morris, who is the president and chairwoman of the Greater New Orleans Housing Alliance. Um, second is Kenneth Smith, who is the president and co-founder of Grace Mar Services over in North Carolina. And then lastly, we've got Bonnie Tiernan, who is the director of community engagement for the Crisis Assistance Ministry, also in North Carolina. So before we turn it over to our speaker, quick agenda, we're going to uh, begin this uh, today's conversation with a quick level setting session where our speakers will talk a little bit about what advocacy means to them and how imposter syndrome has shown up in their work. Uh, then I'll take one or two questions uh, and then we'll go into our panel discussion, which is our final or excuse me, our fireside chat where we'll discuss redefining your role as an advocate owning imposter syndrome. And then lastly, we'll wrap it up with some questions from the audience. But as always, if you all have any questions uh, throughout today's conversation, ask them and we'll try to get them in uh, in between our presentation and panel. So before we get started, we want to ask a poll question of you all, um, a couple of poll questions here. The first being, how big is your organization? We want to get a sense of uh, who's on the call, um, how many, how big your respective organizations are. So if you'll take a moment to fill that poll question out. All right, let's see what results we've got here. It looks like um, about 34% of you are between 11 and 50 people. Uh, about a quarter of you, 27% have less than 10 people. And then about six, or excuse me, another quarter of you uh, have over 100 people. So that is uh, pretty interesting, about 23% of you. And then the final 16% have between 51 and uh, 51 and 100 um, people. So thank you all for taking that poll. Um, one other poll question we want to sort of gauge who's on the call in terms of what your role is at your organization. So if you'll take one more moment, fill out this poll and let us know what is your role within your organization. And if your role is not listed, I would just say pick the closest thing to your role here. And it looks like as these results are coming in, about 30% of you all, about 30% of you all do client services. Another 22% of you all are in leadership. 18% um, of you all administrative. Uh, looks like about 20% uh, of you all do policy and advocacy. And then a final 10% uh, communications there. So a good mix of folks on today's call. With that, thank you all for participating in our poll question. I am going to turn it over to our, our first speaker, Kenny Smith from Grace Marr, uh, to get into what advocacy means for him, to level set a little bit uh, before we dive into our panel. So, Kenny. Good afternoon, all. Uh, thank you, uh, Vanna. Uh, as she said, my name is Kenneth Smith. Uh, I am the president and co-founder of Grace Marr uh, Services. Uh, our, our role and goal uh, in our work is to build stronger, more resilient African-American communities. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Vanna. Uh, when the question was posed to me, what is advocacy for me? I kind of wrote the textbook definition, the act of speaking up and supporting a group or cause or belief and to create a positive change in the world. Uh, at its core, advocacy is about giving voice to the voiceless. Uh, this is something that's near and dear to me uh, is, is, is my work is around creating social justice uh, with the goal of just making a difference in the world and the lives of everyone that I, that I encounter. Uh, next slide, uh, please. Uh, so the imposter syndrome, um, just a quick little fact. 82% uh, of people experience the imposter syndrome. So it's it's not a phenomenon that no one experiences. You're not alone. Uh, even myself and, and others, uh, we just experience the imposter syndrome. And for me, when it shows up, and it, it shows up often, uh, and I forget the typo, it says it manifests. And it manifests with me. I, I sweat. I stutter. I have you know, lack of eye contact, I have poor body language. So that's how the imposter syndrome shows up in, in, in my work. Uh, next slide, Vanna. But as we continue to advocate, we have to push through. We have to continue to advocate and move forward, even though we may be struggling with the imposter syndrome. And I look forward to sharing some of the, the techniques that I use to kind of overcome that and also owning the room when I'm speaking with legislators. Thank you very much, Vanna.
Hello, everyone. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here with my fellow panelists. My name is Bonnie Tiernan, and I am with a local nonprofit called Crisis Assistance Ministry, located in Charlotte, North Carolina. And before I talk about the advocacy piece of what we do, I wanted to just take a minute to let you know a little bit about our core services and then tie in why advocacy is such an important part of even doing direct client services. So at Crisis Assistance, our mission is to provide assistance and advocacy for people in financial crisis, helping them move towards self-sufficiency. And our vision is to inspire our community to justice and generosity as we provide help, hope, and understanding to people struggling with limited financial resources. And we've been doing this work for 48 years. So we're almost as old as the war on poverty, but as we all know, the war is yet to be won, but we keep fighting. So um, next slide. Thank you. So as I alluded to, the core of what we do is providing stability services to the people in our community. Um, our goal is preventing homelessness and preserving dignity for the people we serve. So our basic services are emergency financial assistance with rent and utilities. We also operate a free store where clothing and household goods are provided free of charge to folks in our community. The reason they're free of charge is because we know the experts on how to use their limited financial resources are the families who are experiencing limited financial resources. So if they can get school uniforms for their kids free of charge, that's a few extra dollars or more than a few extra dollars. That's extra resources they can put towards other priorities. And finally, we do offer an extended one-on-one -on -one coaching relationship with economic mobility specialists, which aims to help people identify their relationship with money, figure out the barriers that may be keeping them in a difficult situation, and start taking steps towards coming out of that. Next slide, please. So my area the community engagement program at crisis assistance is relatively new as i said we're almost 50 years old but it's been within the past 10 years or so that we've started to really lean into advocating for the people that we serve because what we recognize is yes people need help individuals need help in the moment in a crisis absolutely but the issues that people are facing are not a result of their individual choices in most cases. They are symptomatic of the system and we're all part of the system. So we started realizing we need to talk about not only the people that we serve, but the issues that they face and how we all collectively can help chip away and change policies and processes so that everybody in not just my community, but yours too, has an opportunity to not just thrive, I mean, sorry, not just survive, but thrive. So in my area, we basically have three areas we focus on. We try to inform our community through blog posts and sharing social media that other thought leaders are putting out there. So we're trying to increase awareness and empathy. Then we try to inspire the community to start taking action. We want to encourage our community to talk honestly about barriers to financial security. We do that through operating um, poverty simulations. We train and support customer advocates, and we convene community educational events. And then finally, we try to influence the decision makers, the legislators, the policy makers. So our customer advocates help us with that. We get them in influential roles in the community. And we also lead um, a coalition of other nonprofits, Financial Security CLT, which I will talk about later. Um, next slide. So this is just a little teaser about what I will talk about as we get into the panel discussion. Uh, the Financial Security CLT is the coalition that we lead we are working together this is a group of nonprofits working together above and beyond our individual missions and visions we have a shared vision of a community where uh, communities of color and marginalized groups are included in the wealth building opportunities that they achieve financial security and have the freedom to choose their own path to prosperity so i will end there and i look forward to the discussion later thank you so much I'll get to that one later.
Andreneka, sorry, you're muted. Okay. Good day, everyone. <laughs> I, I was uh, going to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, like the Truman Show, but then I thought better of it. Um, I'm Andrea Kamaris. Uh, I'm here today representing um, the Put Housing First Triad in Louisiana, um, specifically my role as president and chair of the Greater New Orleans Housing Alliance. Uh, the the NOHA is a 501c4, and so our role inside of how the housing system, the housing reform system, the housing justice system in Louisiana is a complicated one, but it's also really, really clear when you know our, our, our mission uh, that we wanted to see New Orleans rebuilt post Katrina. And we are also a 501c4 that allows us to advocate and lobby and do electoral work. And over the last few years, we have evolved that, that our, our, our strategies in a myriad of ways. Uh, to include more organizing, as well as how to really put pressure using that 501c4 status so that we can do things. We initially started out by talking to people about what someone, what someone who's running for elected office thought about a housing policy. Um, we asked them questions and then shared their answers with the electorate so that people could make their, an, an informed decision. Uh, and then we realized really, relatively quickly that just sharing uh, their answers wasn't good enough. It wasn't what the people deserved. They needed to understand that answer in context. They needed to understand that answer in context with their everyday lives. And uh, imposter syndrome is something really interesting when you think about the work that we do because, uh, we, because we are engaging with policymakers and elected officials, you often run across people who question whether or not they should be doing something if they are the right person to be uh, handling this circumstance or situation. And sometimes they're not. And so imposter syndrome is while something is something that actually cripples a lot of really strong leaders. It, it, it keeps people who deserve to be in those spaces. It, it gets them thinking that they don't deserve to be there. But sometimes it's a good check. It's a gut level gut level check. Uh, for people who don't deserve to be in that space, who shouldn't be doing that work. And, and so instead of um, seeking to um, ignore imposter syndrome, we also need to talk about how you see it as a self-evaluation tool and not simply fake it until you make it, but determine, should you be in this space? Should you be doing this work? Should you be representing this community? Do you not only have the authority, but do you have the right, do you have the skill to do this work? Don't just simply discount it as something that you've got to overcome. Think about whether or not you deserve to be here because that's what advocates like, like the groups, of the folks that we work with in the Put Housing First Triad at the Greater New Orleans Housing Alliance, we're looking for, we're looking for partners who are ready to walk the, 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 the paradigm, that will walk the spectrum of moving from ally to uh, accomplice to full-on co-conspirator. Because that is what it's going to take to change this country, to change our communities for the better. So imposter syndrome is not anything to trifle with. It's not something that we should discount, but it also, it, it also doesn't necessarily mean that you're in the right role that you're doing the right thing. And that's gotta be a part of advocacy. That's gotta be a part, not just simply having the courage to speak up. Um, we often use this, I often use the serenity prayer uh, as a part, as a way of kind of explaining to folks of our advocacy strat strategy. And people tend to get focused on, you know, accepting the things that you cannot change because the serenity prayer is used in a number of different ways and for a lot of people who need to talk about acceptance, our advocacy strategy is when you're accepting something, that there's got to be some thought around why you're accepting it. We want to focus more on the, the discernment, the wisdom to know the difference, difference and the courage to act, the courage to, to uh, investigate and interrogate yourself, the courage to move aside if you're not the right person sitting in the right spot. So I'm excited to be here today to talk more about the pros and the cons of, of imposter syndrome and how 
how Prosperity Now can help so many of you, so many of us, how they have helped so many of us become the leaders that we are today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andronika, and to all of our speakers for the great level setting um, ahead of today's conversation. I'm excited for us to get started in this panel. So I'll ask that all of our panelists uh, come back on screen and I'll actually check the questions box to see if anyone has any questions for you all before we dive into our panel discussion. But I really like one of the things that you said, Andronika, is moving folks from allies to accomplices to full-on co-conspirators. And that's such a great way to think about uh, allyship and, uh, and, and advocacy work. So I'm excited uh, for this conversation, but like I said, I'm going to pause for a moment. Let me just check our questions box here. Um, I saw there was a question about the slides and hopefully you all can, panelists, will you shake your head if you can see my screen? Okay, I just want to make sure. Well, let's dive into the panel discussion. That way we have as much time as possible. And as I mentioned to the to the audience, please feel free if you all have any questions for us, drop them in the chat. I'll be asking them throughout this panel discussion. Um, so for my first question, um, just want to dive right in and talk about confidence building. And I know, Kenny, you kind of alluded to it earlier in your uh, opening remarks, but want to talk a little bit about how you as an advocate have managed to build your confidence specifically uh, while doing this work, while doing racial economic justice work that we know, you know, oftentimes people don't approach with confidence. So how have you been able to build that? And I'm going to say uh, for our panelists, if you're not speaking, if you'll mute yourself, and then if you want to chime in, definitely unmute. So Kenny, I'll start with you. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so so I think on any issue, uh, especially an issue uh, such as uh, racial economic injustice and things of that nature, uh, or any new topic that I'm trying to digest, uh, I, I want to become the expert. I think that kind of helps stave off the imposter syndrome if I halfway know what I'm talking about. And, and really, when I'm when I'm training staff or myself, I'm working with someone, I try to give them just four easy steps to really become a master of any topic that you want to advocate for. And there's really four simple steps. The first thing I do is I, I instruct in someone or myself, mm -hmm. hey, research and memorize the information that you've researched. Just, just commit it to memory, just like we did in school, right? To pass the test, you commit it to memory. Then after the test is over, you don't use it again and it's gone. Well, in this case, the next thing you want to do, you want to start utilizing that information. So there's a challenge out there to meet with uh, legislators uh, in the month of August. And you guys can win a really cool prize, which is, well, I'm not gonna take their thunder. They'll tell you about the prize. But once you memorize that information, start utilizing it. Go out to your local legislator and just have a conversation about the information you just memorized. Now you're not gonna know it, but you'll at least have it committed to memory. And as you have more of those encounters with the information that you've memorized and utilizing it, then you begin to internalize it. Then you start to get those aha moments. Then you start to truly understand the depth of the subject uh, as you utilize it with other individuals. And then it's just like uh, when I taught basketball, you know, I always tell my kids, you know, you can't go behind the back until you can dribble with right hand and left hand. So once you kind of mastered the right hand, left hand dribble, now you can start personalizing things. You can start going behind your back. You can start doing the no look passes. And now you really truly become an expert and that topic in which you are trying to advocate for. So those are just four simple steps that I utilize and really just grasp on the topic, being able to utilize it, begin to understand it, and now really truly being a very, very uh, allied, as I, I think uh, the young lady said, uh, advocate in, in the space in which I'm trying to, uh, to, to advocate for. Savannah, can I jump in there? Um, those are excellent points there, Kenny. I, I'm definitely going to use them, definitely. Um, I come at this question, I think, from a slightly different angle uh, because we don't do direct advocacy directly with legislators. Um, but, and I also realized I didn't address the imposter syndrome in my intro. So I'd like to tie those two together along with something Andronika said before. Uh, and that is, for me personally, in my work, um, the way imposter syndrome shows up is just what um, Andronika said. Am I the right person to be in this room? I'm, I'm a white woman. I've never experienced a lot of the barriers and obstacles and issues and traumas that the people I advocate for have. So I do often look in the mirror. I've been doing this work 19 years. Um, I look in the mirror. I ask myself that question. Am I the right person to be speaking up at this moment about this topic? 
And what I've learned through the years is that our customer advocate training program is the biggest um, confidence builder for me because these are people who've come to us in a financial crisis. They, it was the worst day of their life when they encountered us, but through the journey with us over time, trust building, um, going through our customer advocate training, which is where they learn that their voice is the most important in these discussions. They are the expert, they have the wisdom, they deserve to be recognized for that and listened to. And so how I build my confidence is through learning and listening to the people who've lived the issues that I'm advocating to change. I, I'm not an expert and I never will be, but I can learn every day. So that's my take on it. Thank you. Thank you both for that. Um, second question here, I guess to kind of build off of that when we talk about building confidence, I know that as Kenny alluded to earlier, for me, I always tell people is the, you know, I come from a sports background and so like just about anything in order to get better at something or to get more confident at something, you just, you keep doing it. Um, for me in basketball, I kept dribbling and eventually I learned how to be a point guard. And so I think through this, keep having conversations and you'll eventually learn how to be an advocate. But um, that leads me to my second question. Um, I think a lot of the anxiety that advocates tend to have is around meeting legislators face to face. And we, I mean, that can be very intimidating for anybody, but particularly for someone who's never done it before. Um, and especially those legislators uh, who can be adversarial. And we know that this day and age, uh, things tend to be very polarized. Um, so all speakers, but I'll start with you again, Kenny. Um, what advice would you offer to folks who have anxiety about meeting with, with those legislators? You know, great, great question. And and I, I feel like I, I, I've done this a thousand times. And, and, and especially if you're meeting someone for the first time, I really try to take the anxiety away by not putting the pressure of trying to do a presentation. My first job when I meet someone for the first time is to understand. Uh, and, and I'm going to break understanding down real quick because the one thing I, I try to help people under, understand, another understand there, understanding and agreeing are two different things. So, so you want to go in to understand. And the best way to do that is come prepared with questions. It's really easy to think about good questions to ask. You don't have to present anything. All you have to do is ask the question and listen. But, but more importantly, when you're asking questions, it takes that, that anxiety away. And it starts to build a relationship because believe it or not, people like people who listen to them talk. You just think about it. the person who will listen to you speak and talk, you, you tend to gravitate to that person. More importantly, as you're, as you're asking your questions, mm -hmm. the legislators are gonna tell you everything that you wanna know about them, right? They're gonna tell you about their platform. They're gonna tell you about their policies. They're gonna tell you about the things that they're pushing and they're near, dear to them. And so you've done three things. You've diffused the anxiety you started to understand where that legislator stands on certain issues that you may be advocating about. More importantly, you started to develop a relationship. And it's really easy to have another meeting with someone you have a relationship with that you understand. Even though you don't agree, it makes it so much easier to have that second and that third and that fourth meeting. And then that's when you really start to accomplish things because you know where each other stands, you know what each other wants, and you really start to say, well, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna use the word compromise, but you start to come come to common ground on things. And it all starts with, you know, building that relationship. But again, when I'm first meeting with people, I take all the anxiety away, no presentations. I'm just gonna ask questions, sit back and listen. So hopefully that's helpful. So I'll jump in here, Vanna. Uh, so to, to, I agree with Kenny, and but I want to get a little more foundational for folks. Uh, one of the things that I teach my team, and uh, as we are doing our organizing work, we engage with our community partners around, is we've got to also get com comfortable with conflict. And a lot of people aren't comfortable with conflict. And that's a, one of the reasons why I think imposter syndrome is so prevalent is that so you're 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 sometimes you're going into 
meetings with legislators and we just got to be real about it they're gonna gaslight you in the room they're gonna gaslight you in the space particularly if it is something like housing where there's a deep blind spot that it is at the core of you know society and that you're gonna have to force them to confront some of those biases in order to even get the simplest concession this is something that we've seen with criminal justice reform work with environmental justice reform uh, we still have a lot of these blind spots with housing and so you're 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 because you're telling that person you're you're forcing them to confront that they have a blind blind spot that has had them has had them reduce someone to uh, three-fifths of a person almost right uh, particularly if you're talking about an issue that is racially tinged, uh, because folks don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear criticism. And we got to also be frank about the fact that disproportionately legislators, particularly in the South, are going to be white. And these are not folks who are comfortable with uh, dealing with their, their racial blind spots. I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations where you didn't say anything, but then the next thing you know, they're going, did you just call me racist? No, did you hear me say you are racist? Uh, when I call you racist, trust me, you'll remember it. And you will be clear that I won't just, I'm not gonna tiptoe around it. I'm gonna call you a racist or I'm gonna say what you're doing is racist. And so also not letting them deflect like that, right? Say, yeah, we're not, we're not here to talk about you. And we are also not here to talk about your feelings. We're here to talk about you doing your job. Uh, and so folks have to get comfortable with conflict. And the fact that, yes, you have to build a relationship. Kenny is absolutely right. You have to build a relationship. But here's the, the trick that I keep in mind. Um, these folks work for us. They volunteered. They offered to come and work for us. We elected them. We selected them to work for us. That is the beginning of the relationship. We don't have to like each other. We work together. We don't have to shoot. We don't have to shoot marbles. We don't have to get drinks. I don't need to come to your kids' christening. I need you to show up at work, and I need you to do your job. And that is the relationship. That's that's the relationship. That's the parameters of the relationship. And a lot of elected officials and policymakers uh, count on the fact that people's lives are such that they they can't do their part of the relationship and check in on them, right? They're just like, look, I gotta go to work. Uh, my kids are sick. Uh, we're evacuating because of this hurricane and I can't necessarily show up all the time. But if you are a professional advocate, if you are a community leader who is moving into advocacy and organizing, you, you have to own the fact that that space, that relationship is built in. It is yours. You are their boss. And it's review time, and people don't like getting reviews at work. It, it or, and some people like the conflict. Some, some people like the feedback and things like that. Not everybody does, and particularly they're doing a bad job. Uh, <laughs> and so, it's it's gonna be uncomfortable. It's a hard conversation. You, the more you do it, the easier it's going to get. And the and the and you diffuse a lot of it by making sure that they need to expect it, that that you're going to be doing it routinely and regularly. Perfect, thank you both for that. Um, I could have stayed on that question all day, but we've got several other questions, but no, we're gonna continue the continue in this same space a little bit. Um, and Andronika, I wanna keep it here for you, this question. Um, my, my question on the screens is how your advocacy uh, strategy shifted post COVID, but I really, not even referring to the pandemic itself, but just sort of using this pandemic as a time marker, right? To represent the last couple of years, how your advocacy strategies changed, changed. I mean, we we know that our world has changed over the last couple of years in many ways. Labor has changed. The way that do, we do work has changed. The way that we engage legislators has, have changed. Some of them are still doing virtual meetings. Um, but just thinking about in this era over the last several years, how have your advocacy strategies changed um, you know, there's new movement building strategies. Um, we've seen these these new commitments to racial equity over the last couple of years. But just talk a little bit about how your work has changed. I'm going to start with you, Andronika, but if others want to chime in, absolutely feel free. So uh, it, it, there there was a lot of energy around because of the pandemic, because of the, the severity of the crisis, 
And unfortunately, uh, now that we're still dealing with COVID, but we have tried to return back to that pre-COVID, um, you know, back in the office or back out in the world or not wearing masks, whatever that means for you, because we're certainly not done with, with, with COVID, but we are living with it. So one of the things that happened is it was very clear to us that COVID was like Hurricane Katrina, was another disaster that put the housing crisis in real simple terms. Before you could get a vaccine, before you could get a mask as a regular person, the only thing you could do was go home. That's what we were we told everybody to do. And the fact that most policymakers, elected officials from the highest to the lowest said go home, but did not do the very simple act of guaranteeing that every American had housing to go to. So that was very clear to us how deep the issues around housing were, how entrenched the biases and the blind spots still are. And as we move through uh, the, the, the summer of Black Lives Matter and the death of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey and George Floyd and these commitments to racial equity and people telling us in Black-led organizations and BIPOC-led organizations who care about equity issues that we wanted to listen to you. And fast forward through uh, to us daring here in Louisiana to do electoral work and to do power shifting work and to run into white supremacy in the most unexpected of places, philanthropy. Um, and amongst our own partners who, when we lay out a strategy that actually could shift power to black people, to uh, low income white people, philanthropy and white allied organizations fall and sabotage and retreat and realizing that we also needed to be able to hold our partners accountable and assess them on the fly and and then also take the next steps to say we can't you can't work with us anymore and to hold that line and then to win right to see success to see uh changes be brought about and then to say okay that worked we're going to do it again and so our, our, our policies, our strategies, and our advocacy hasn't shifted. What has happened is, is that we have been able to demonstrate in a relatively short period of time that we're not crazy and that, <laughs> um, that there are people who didn't get it, no matter how well-intentioned they were, no matter how much they met well, they really, they were trapped in uh, the, the spectrum around white supremacy. And some of them were people of color, some of them were well-meaning white folks, some of them were people who wanted to help, and that they all needed to really be clear about their place inside of this work, and that if they were going to help, that we could no longer accept the mealy mouth, that this is like our, this was our version of Dr. King's letter from Birmingham jail. The moderate and the folks who are going to sabotage, got to get got. And um, that we couldn't, we could, we couldn't simply pretend that our um, that our enemies were our friends because they said they were our friends. They had to demonstrate that. And keeping the community's needs first and foremost, how many people could get housed? How many people could keep housing? How many programs were out there helping folks navigate this catastrophe that the pandemic was? How many people were losing their lives? How many people's children were falling through cracks and crevices? And, and not being responded to. It, so for us, it's always been very clear and very binary, whether or not you're doing good. Um, and then also, but also getting people to understand that and, and assess it for themselves. If, I, I don't know if Bonnie, uh, I, and I agree with almost everything, and I'm gonna say almost everything, I'm gonna say everything she said. Uh, I don't know if Bonnie wanna jump in there, but for me, uh, advocacy work was not, uh, at the forefront of what I what what we do, uh, but it was COVID that kind of shined the light and just magnified everything. You know, as a program operator, uh, you know, you kind of you you're in your silo. You're running this program. You're doing a good job, and you're looking at this group of group of individuals that you're serving. And then when COVID came out, and I started reading these studies, and all these these lights just starting out, all these things that impacted the communities in which we are trying to serve. It just made me realize that a, a program, which I call a transaction, for me is not the answer. 
I got to get upstream. I got to start helping to influence how money flows, as 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 Miss Morris said. Uh, I had to start influence how policy is written because those are the things that are going to drive the change that we need. And so that COVID just just kind of awakened me, or awoken me, excuse me, to to really jump in and really get upstream and really start advocating, sitting down with legislators, helping them understand that though you may be writing policy or funding certain things, there's a different lens that needs to be on what you're doing because unfortunately you're missing sometimes. And and I, I'm, I try to be more tactful in my approach. Uh, that's that's who I am. I'm a tactful guy. I'm going to try to charm you. I'm going to try to have a little wit, a little bit of a little bit of expertise behind it. Um, but if I ever get in a situation where I when I get gaslighted, I know who to call. Miss Morris, I'm gonna be calling. Hey, th this guy just gaslighted me. You need you need to you need to fly to Charlotte. But but really, that's what COVID did for me. It just it just it just shined a light that th there's work to be done, and I think I need to be in a different space. So I think I am called to be in this space of advocacy. Um, thank you. Awesome. I could sit and listen to you both all day. Um, so I would say, you know, COVID um, for us as an older, largely white-led, stable relatively large organization with lots of funding, right? It um, it made us rethink how we operate in our environment here in our city, because when we had to shut down, we were not quite frankly, nimble enough to react quickly enough to the needs of our community. We got there, but at the beginning, we did not know how to scramble because we had become, and this is me speaking, from my point of view, not for my organization, but we had become comfortable in being um, a lead organization. So what happened in the community was lots of grassroots, first time nonprofits popped up out of nowhere with tons of talent and great ideas. And they started getting funding, and which is wonderful. But we were like, but we need both, right? We need the stability and the generational wisdom of an older um, organization and we need the brilliance and energy of these new grassroots so that's really what i think is exciting about financial security clt the coalition that we are now currently leading uh, because it combines both we have grassroots community activists and large nonprofits and everything in between and so i think to me the strategy needs to be kind of what Kenny was talking about is we all need to be involved. We don't all need to be advocating necessarily in front of legislators, that's needed. But some of us also need to be just listening to each other and learning to each other, learning from each other and figuring out how we can combine our strengths into collaborative effort instead of trying to compete for what often seems like limited pie, right? But it's not really pie, there is, endless it's an endless buffet right but we tend to look at it from this competition of well if they get that grant i didn't get that grant so i lose but no let's work together and it, it's about much more than the funding it's about what collective action can we take that will make meaningful differences in the lives of our community members so thank you no, thank you all for that. I appreciate the three diverse but very necessary perspectives. And Kenny, to your point, I was laughing earlier. I'm like, that's the great thing about Camp Prosperity is that we want like realness on this. We want real conversation in Camp Prosperity, however you all bring it. But I will say one of the things that I'm reminded of with this question and with this conversation and hearing your responses is I sent this in our Camp Prosperity newsletter on yesterday, but I saw a really interesting study last week by Independent Sector. I don't know if you all have seen that but it's a collection of uh, folks from academia who put together this research on the decline in nonprofits engaging in advocacy. And it was really disturbing to me, but also very eye-opening, some of the numbers in this research. If you get a chance after, camp, after this webinar, please go look at uh, yesterday's newsletter. The link to it is in there. But really interesting stuff on just the numbers that they're showing in terms of the decline of it. And you can also see, um, you know, there are some similarities between uh, organizations who are uh, led by people of color, uh, some trends there in terms of whether or not they're doing advocacy, whether people's boards are majority people of color, and whether or not they're doing advocacy. 
but in addition to resources, it, it also talks about uh, some of the impl impl excuse me, implications of nonprofits not doing this work. So just another reason I, I, tr I thought about at the last minute plugging that into this webinar, but I didn't have a, a, enough time to kind of get that session together. But it's really interesting stuff. And I would just encourage everyone to go and check that out. Uh, but Bonnie, I know you were just talking about relationships, and that actually leads me to my next question here. Uh, we know that in advocacy, um, relationships, like anything, I mean, just like anything else, relationships are key in advocacy. Um, how have you been able to build some authentic relationships in the face of experiencing imposter syndrome? That is a great question. Um, and to me, the answer is you need a lot of time and patience. So I'll just talk from my personal experience in building our customer advocate program. As I mentioned, these are people who needed our, they needed emergency financial assistance at one point. And then they've developed along their journey to a point now where they speak publicly to elected officials. They serve on advisory councils. They um, speak to community leaders about the difficult and sometimes ugly issues surrounding poverty. Um, and so, in order to help them get to that place, I thought, okay, we'll do an eight week training and then they'll be good to go. Well, <laughs> not exactly. I had to slow way down and take my ego. I thought I had all these great ideas for the topics we would talk about and they would be ready for everything. Well, these are folks just like all of us, but to the nth degree, who have a lot of stress in their lives. Um, they have become advocates while they're still living difficult, challenging lives. And so I had to stop thinking about this relationship being on my terms. What I need from you is for you to show up every, you know, that, no, that's not, what do you need? What do you envision? What do you need from me? I had to slow all the way back down to the beginning of actually sort of what Kenny was talking about with legislators of, I don't come with an agenda, come with questions, authentic questions, and then truly listen to the answers and be willing to adjust whatever you thought this was gonna be into what it's gonna be with the two of you or the five of you or however many people you're building this relationship with. Um, so it's humility and it is the constant self-checking of, okay, I have a job and there are expectations of me. I'm supposed to produce something, but that runs counter to building an authentic relationship sometimes. So it's really, really recognizing that you can't do this quickly. In some cases, it won't happen at all, but um, if you really want an authentic relationship, you have to let the other person help define what that means. I think that's the key takeaway I would want to leave you with. And I think that's a great takeaway. Go ahead, Andrea. It looks like you're about to hop in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, and so the I was listening to Bonnie, and and exactly the same thoughts occur, and and the same things happen in in our work as well. Because housing is, it's not like Black Lives Matter. It's not like voter, voter get, get out the vote. It's not like environmental justice, right? Even though everybody needs it, again, the, black, the, the blind spots are significant and deep, all right? And so people who come to us who want to organize invariably are going to be in crisis. And we're an advocacy organization. We're a set of organ advocacy organizations and policy wonks. And, and so how do you, not say to folks, look, we can't help you. Um, it, we're a policy shop. And and so we made a commitment to not do that. So uh, one, because we're a policy shop, we know where everything is or isn't. So if people call, we actually have um, pieces in place where uh, when people call looking for help, they can get, we have a resource guide that uh, part of our work is assessing the current system of housing and the resources necessary to navigate all kinds of emergencies and crises. So people call and get those questions. We make that information available through social media and online. But when we start talking about building those relationships with community when it comes to organizing and leadership, 
we have deliberately created spaces inside the various organizations where community leaders have power and real authority and are actually compensated for their time. And this is something that's very controversial. Uh, a lot of organizers, a lot of well-meaning organizers, I've heard them say over the years saying, well, you know, I've just not had this conversation as recently as three months ago um, with one of our national partners. You know, I'm just really uncomfortable with the pay for play concept, right? And for us, it's real clear. Um, we as a policy shop, as a, as a, we pay for all kinds of analysis. We pay for all kinds of insight. We have to. So why should we treat this most valuable insight, this most valuable uh, piece of our work any differently? Why we gotta get that for free? How do, how do we get that for free when we pay for everything else? I need to know the data uh, on, 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 on foreclosure analysis, right? Because it's not easy to get, we gotta pay for that. We've got a, a contract that we're working on right now. So why not compensate the person who is explaining to us what that means in real life and in real time. And, and, and we do recognize that, you know, yes, some people show up just for the money. So um, if, we, if you're a paid advocate, you're getting a check too, right? Would you, <laughs> as dedicated as we are, as passionate as we are there, you know, people tell me all the time, oh my God, you're so passionate, right? Uh, and, and so, I, you know, that comes in a, that that comes with a lot of shade sometimes and a lot of consternation and sometimes some admiration. So you take it as it as it comes. But um, I'm also paid to do this, and I'm incredibly fortunate to do something that I love that can pay my bills. Uh, so why not offer other people the same opportunity? And also, if, even if you're just doing it because you pay your bills, if you're good at it, who cares? And that's what you know. I, community work, community leadership looks like for us. Uh, and so our relationships are deep uh, and rock solid. And, uh, and, and we have built them and cultivated them with intentionality, uh, with the recognition that, and, and, we, and again, no shade to other organizations who can't afford to do that, who because of how their organization is structured, can't even consider doing it. We, we, all, we also do uh, in our work, in exchange for their um, their advice and their consultation, we also provide, they get paid training, right? So sometimes they're working with us and they meet with us at least once a month. Sometimes it's a session where they're asking questions, they're making decisions. Sometimes it's we're sharing information. Uh, it's all curated, it's all planned, it's all um, it, it's all about all there, all out there. And it also requires of us honesty, right? So if someone asks, well, I want to go work with this group and they're not compensating us. We're going to explain why. We're going to explain that there's nothing wrong with that and that this is how a lot of these partners work because they have to. We're doing what we're doing because this issue is so extraordinarily un, un, uh, unseen. That's why we have gone to this extraordinary, these extraordinary means and extraordinary measures. Uh, and, and that other people can't doesn't, doesn't negate their work. If you believe in it and you can manage it, and if we're compensating you and you can swing some other free volunteer time, that's a win-win. Uh, and so people appreciate that honesty, they appreciate that frankness, uh, and they, they appreciate um, how we have structured this so that, we, that, that they know that we value them. Great, thank you both. And I, I purposely hopped in before Kenny could because I wanna get us to our last two questions here. This has been a great conversation so far. And I, I know we still have, we have a couple questions in the questions box from the audience. I'll wait until our Q&A session to ask those. Gwen, I, I see you have a question here as well. Um, but Andronika, I'm gonna keep it here with you. I was a little bit hesitant about putting this question into the conversation, but I just wanted to throw it out there because it's something that we get often when we get ready to do Camp Prosperity every year. This is something that comes up over and over again. And so I figured why not throw it out for this panel? And so wanted to see if you had any any thoughts, suggestions on ways that um, organizational leaders can better pre prepare board members to, to become advocates? In addition to board members, I'll just say stakeholders. I'm talking about board members, but if there are other key stakeholders that, that folks could uh, better prepare to advocate. Any thoughts on that? Andronika, I'll start with you, and then if others have uh, want to chime in as well. Sure. This is a, it's a complicated question. It's also one of those questions that kind of lift up the conflict piece. In, 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 in expressly, right? Because the board members 
set the vision of the organization. They are the ones with fiduciary responsibility. The staff and the executive director are in charge of the day-to-day -day operations. They're in charge of the impact, but the board is the one who sets the course and they can turn the course. And so you would think that that means that they would be, they would be perfect advocates because part of their role is raising money and resources for, for, the, for the mission. But unfortunately, philanthropy is, you know, uh, strewn with a lot of minefields. And sometimes in order to navigate those minefields, board members compromise, board members adjust their own thinking so that they have, they, have, they actually are in opposition mentally to the work. And, and so you've got to understand that. And, and some people make the decision, well, this person's bringing in money to, to help this work. And so, but they're not your best spokesperson. They're not your best advocate. They, they can go off and get you some money, but they don't really understand or believe in your core mission. And so you got to be honest about that, right? You, you've got to be clear about that. So if that person is the person who's going to get you a meeting with a legislator, that's the person who is going to, um, uh, you know, speak out to the media, you have to be able to assess them and, and then have and then have the conversation about whether or not are you going to be turning that person into an advocate or are you going to just accept where they are and let them play that role, let them keep writing checks or raising money. And 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 but for the board members who want to become advocates, who want to be to to participate in it, just like you would work with your community partners, they need to be trained. They need to understand your issues. Bonnie just went through a a, a, a really clear way uh, that's similar to a lot of the works that we do. Uh, what the training schedule could look like for board members um, in order so that they could prepare themselves for advocate. Treat them just like you would do your community partners, because they are. Um, they've got more authority, they've got more power, power, but but at the end of the day, community members, particularly if you're working in a specific field, those community members have almost as much power as the board members, because if you're not doing what's necessary, they can shut you down. If you are an integral, helpful part of their community, they will be your, they'll help you raise money. So think of board members as community members on steroids. And how do you educate them? How do you engage them? And how do you assess whether or not they're really willing and able to help you achieve your mission in that advocacy spot? Thank you for those clear steps. Um, and you knocked that one out of the park. I, like I said, I always hesitate putting that question. We get it often, but I just thought I'd throw it out there. Um, can, I, final question. Uh, Anna, yeah, can I just one quick addition, really great points there. Um, one thing that we do, and I think a lot of organizations do, but it's very effective, is make sure that at least a portion of our board is made up of people with lived experience so that they can challenge at the board level some assumptions that board members are making. Um, so I think that's another good way. That's a great point, Bonnie. Thank you for hopping in to say that. Um, and then final question. Kenny, I'm going to bring you back into the conversation for this last one. Um, but just a general question about, you know, the latest tools and research. I, I mentioned earlier this, this study by Independent Sector, but just wanted to know from you all, um, how do you stay abreast of the latest? I think a part of um, overcoming imposter syndrome is like knowing what you're talking about and knowing what you're doing. And the only way to do that is just, you know, staying on top of research and things. So, What's out there? How do you stay abreast of everything that's happening in the advocacy world? Wow, it's it, it's a lot. Um, information is, is out there. I'm going to pick up my cell phone uh, because, you know, as a older gentleman, uh, I remember a time where to get information, you had to go get 100 newspapers and you, and you had to go to the library and get encyclopedias. So I don't know the age group that we're speaking to, but I use my phone as my first means of really just getting information. I use a tool called Google Search. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but you can actually put into your phone, Google, if this article hits, send it to me. And literally whatever topic I wanna to learn about, I'll put it in my Google and it'll just start sending me articles, information. Anytime something hits the web that is talking about that, it comes right to my phone. So that's one of the tools I use. The second thing is, is it's sessions like this. I mean, I am always attending some type of session, not always as a panelist. 
sometimes just to go and listen and hear what's going on. Newsletters. I am a, a subscriber to the Prosperity Now newsletter. I have been for seven years now, I think it is. So it, it's, it's really just making sure that the information on the topics that mm -hmm. you want to be enlightened about, you're just making sure that they're in your forefront that you're able to get access to them. And there's just so many different ways to do that now. Uh, phone being number one. Yeah, and I would say um, coalitions, whether formal or informal, are a great way to keep up. Nobody can keep up with everything. It's just a whirlwind of information out there. So I would say creating networks, whether they're formal or informal, and also Prosperity Now is a treasure uh, of a resource that we use all the time. Well, thank you, and Bonnie, certainly thank you so much for the plug. That is what we aim to be every single day as a resource. And I'll throw out another one that we, we used to have it on Camp Prosperity, have them on Camp Prosperity every year, but we did it this year. Vulgar Advocacy is also a great resource for folks. I always plug them every chance that I get. They do great work around um, advocacy limits for nonprofits, general tips for uh, nonprofit advocacy, voter engagement tips. They just do excellent work. Um, they do webinars every now and then, uh, but certainly coalitions, everything that, that Kenny and, and Bonnie said is absolutely right. So um, thank you all for that. Uh, and now I will turn it over to some audience questions. I know that we've had several uh, in the audience. And so I apologize, panelists. I was not able to give you a heads up on what those questions were, so I'll ask them live. Uh, but also uh, encourage the audience again to drop more questions into the, into the chat, and I'll get to as many of these as I can. Uh, the first one here is from Gwen, and I'll just pose it to all of you. Someone, please feel free to chime in. Uh, do you have any tips for securing an, an initial meeting with a legislator? I have not received responses to many emails I've sent seeking an initial meeting. Um, I, I'll jump in. Uh, one of the things that I, I try to do is, one, make sure you're aligning with, with their platform. Uh, so you're, what, what, what are you trying to meet with them about? But the other thing that I do is I kind of go around that individual, start understanding the people around that individual. And, and sometimes you can't get directly to them, but you may be able to get to their assistant, may be able to get to a peer, may be able to get to a coworker. And, and, and so what I try to do is surround that individual with my name on their list like oh i met with ken he's a he's a nice guy we were talking about this and and all of a sudden my name starts popping up and they're like and he's like wait a minute this is the guy who's emailing me maybe i need to take his a meeting with him so start maybe looking around that individual not going directly to them but maybe just working around and and, and working with some people around him or her and, and that might uh, uh help you with getting an engagement meeting or uh, Lisa, uh, contact a response from that individual. So yeah, I think Kenny's right. It's 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 a challenge, and and it's also really disheartening to hear because again, they do work for you, and that they would someone in their office wouldn't return your call. Whatever's happening is you. I do recommend also, in addition to uh, figuring out who who else do you know that they know. Um, and asking help of board members, but if you're not a part of a formal organization, any of your friends and colleagues or anyone else who might know them, but also persistent, calling very respectfully, emailing the office and saying, hey, I would like to meet with such and such. I would like to meet with such and such. I wanna talk about this issue. Um, and, and, and also make it really clear how, their, what their responsibility is around the issue, right? Uh, because you'll have policymakers and elected officials who uh, who may not understand why it should matter to them, right? They may they may think, hey, this is not anything to do with me, and this is just somebody shrugging off. Now that person is still a constituent, and they should still respond to them. Uh, but you you also do need to make it clear to them why you want to talk to them about it. And if it's just a matter of they knocked on your door and asked you for their vote and said, hey, call me anytime, and you voted for them. Remind them of that, too. Uh, 
Absolutely. Great, great responses there. And Arturo, I see you had a similar question. Hopefully, um, hopefully this response answered it, what Kenny and Andranika just said. If it didn't, please um, let me know again in the chat. Um, another question here from Daniela, for those of us in communications, what are the best ways to get stakeholders to participate in advocacy? Example, sign petitions, sign letters, et cetera. What do you think are some of the best ways to get stakeholders to participate? Well, for us, it's a combination of the, there's the issue of the moment, right? There's, all, there's unfortunately, inside of our work, there's always some kind of crisis or catastrophe happening. Uh, that that requires uh, people to engage, to share what's going on, uh, to 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 speak out, to, to 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 respond. And again, that 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 issue of the moment uh, it has an unpredictable uh, uh, impact, right? Some some people could show up. You get a hundred people to show up around short-term rentals, and uh, that affects the citizenry and the housing market. But the something that disproportionately affects the majority of New Orleans, like renters policy, nobody shows up for, right? And so uh, that if you leave it to chance, I should say, if you if you leave it to chance, that's that's how it'll shape out. So um, what we find is one, building relationships with folks over the long run when there is something happening, base building work. So last year. Uh, after uh, Hurricane Ida, uh, her, the hurricane, not it wasn't last year, year before last, two years now, Hurricane Ida rolled through. And, uh, you know, New Orleans was plunged into darkness, even though it didn't get a direct hit. And we started talking and working with partners to educate them on what happened, why this was happening, and what was the failure of, of local and state regulators to um, that could have stopped the situation, got people to sign up. And then a few weeks later, when one of the regulatory bodies actually was moving to do something that was a scam, you brought, you know, just the, the high level, it was a scam. It was a bait and switch. They were pretending to address the issue. We sent out a, a call to action and said, hey, they're running a bait and switch and you need to call them. We found out about it very last minute. We got 200 people to call the regulatory office on a Sunday afternoon. Um, to, and it stopped them from moving things forward. So you also have to be able to communicate with folks in a way that's really clear for them to understand and give them something to do and, and that shows them a path to victory. And I would add that um, for us, at least what works well is a lot of the issues that we are advocating around or asking people to sign on to or get interested in on the surface people might not see how it actually connects to them. They think it's someone else's problem. Those of us who are doing this work every day, that it seems strange that there are people out there who don't get that this is everybody's problem. But there are lots and lots of people who are not affected by these um, issues day to day. So you need to draw them in. You need to structure your communications so that it's not those people with this problem that we're trying to help those poor people no, it's this is our community. This is the kind of community we want. You need to help people see how they are connected to whatever the action is you're asking them to take. That it's not just helping someone else, it's in their own best interest to get involved. Absolutely, all of that, what you all said, you know, developing clear steps, a path to victory, connecting the issue to individual people. But I'll also add to that um, from Prosperity Now's perspective and from my personal perspective from being here, one of the things that we, I was very intentional about, we were very intentional about like my first three to four years here is figuring out why people don't wanna take advocacy action um, and, and, and checking our assumption that, you know, people just aren't doing it for whatever reason or they're not interested, but just generally asking why through surveys, either I would call people up and like, ask them on these calls that we would be having with our various working groups or putting out a survey to people asking why they don't participate in advocacy. And two of the reasons that we got back was, um, you know, I think the most common reason was like, we don't have the capacity. There's just too many steps. And so for us, that led to us getting our online advocacy tool. All you have to do, we'll pre-draft the email for you. All you have to do is go in and click send. It's that easy we'll pre-draft a phone script for you. All you have to do is go in and click a button and you're connected to your legislator. So that solved the problem of 
uh, of we don't have the capacity. We made it a one-click process. The second thing that we always heard from people is, well, I work for a nonprofit. Our, our 501c3 status is in jeopardy if we advocate. And one of the ways that we kind of dispel that myth, myth is I mentioned Boulder Advocacy earlier. We brought in an organization who specializes in that work, teaching these organizations exactly what they can do and exactly what they can't do. And so we, you know, I just brought up those two examples to say, like, ask people. Don't, you know, you know, don't assume X, Y, and Z, but flat out ask the people in your respective community. Those are the responses that I got back doing advocacy work for Prosperity Now. However, Bonnie over in, in Charlotte, you may get completely different answers, or Andronika over in, in New Orleans, you never know what barriers your community is facing. But I would just encourage folks to ask those questions of your stakeholders and, and really respond to the answers. Um, another question here from Thelma. Uh, we all know social media is, is huge, and it's one way that folks um, can, can try to amplify their advocacy message. Uh, but Thelma is asking here, how can you be most effective in getting your advocacy message out on social media? I don't know how engaged you all are in social media, uh, but if you have thoughts there, please chime in. So, can you were going to answer? Oh, I was going to say, social media is hard when it comes to advocacy uh, because it 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 is designed. Uh, to get the most engagement for the least amount of effort, right? It, and it, and it's, it's, it's kind of cheap in a lot of ways, right? Um, people get attention by doing the worst kinds of things, saying the worst kind of things. Uh, they get rewarded for it, and it, it, it can be, it's so problematic. But it is a way that people communicate. You can't turn your nose up at it. You can't stare at it. Um, you've got to figure out how to leverage it. And um, it's it's hard, right? So we we don't leave any stone unturned, right? So we will text, we will call, we will we will email, and we will tweet and um, post on Facebook and LinkedIn and IG and everywhere what we're talking about. So we hit all of them. Uh, one thing that we have actually cultivated that's just ours um, on social media is live tweeting meetings. Um, so that people can know what's going on, right? So uh, if you follow our Twitter feed, any any uh, meeting in, in Metro New Orleans and statewide that has anything to do with housing, we will live tweet the meeting so people will know what's going on. And we do so in a way that people can understand, right? Because um, we believe that one thing that policymakers like to do is bore you into complacency by having these really, <laughs> these really, um, very regulated and very strict, strictly set up meetings that are often really fast and people don't know what's going on um, while their lives are being decided for them. And so making sure that it's accessible. And so that's something that we're known for. It's something that's based at ours and it's something that people can rely upon. And so that's the big thing is figuring out how social media can help you. Because if you go into it thinking that you're gonna win at the game of social media, right? Um, you're not, it, 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 you, you're, you're just not, because um, it, it's just not designed for that uh, in this way. It works really well in a crisis of sharing information and things like that, but, and, and, but you can cultivate a, a, a significant following um, and, and people who care about your issues, uh, but it won't ever be, I think, something that, that uh, we can use uh, for the long run, other than as a, a, so a source of information is, and for constancy, and that's just kind of not what social media is. It is very much of the moment, um, and we just have you just have to figure out how to balance it. Yeah, and I think what you said there at the end, Andronika, is key with balancing. Um, you know, social media is a tool for getting your message out, and, and to your point, figure out if it's the right tool for your organization and what ways you can maximize that tool. I think, for instance, on Twitter, one of the, the things that we tend to do quite often is, um, you know, what memes are out there. I think for the past week, like Barbie memes were floating around social media, you know, hook on to those, those types of themes. If Barbie is a thing that's happening, if, you know, whatever the, the, the talk of the town is for any respective day, hop on that bandwagon and get your message out. Hop on whatever hashtag you know, provided that it's an appropriate hashtag, <laughs> hop on that hashtag and, and try to amplify your message. So it, it can be a bit cheesy, a bit corny, a bit, you know, whatever, but 
you know, these days you, you do what you have to do to get your message out. And, and to your point, Angelica, like you said, social media is a tool and, and maximize it to the best of your ability. But that, that's just the way that we tend to do is, is jump on, um, you know, jump on things that are trending or jump on, on memes that are floating out there. And we use Twitter, Instagram. I think we also use TikTok. So wherever the people are, um, go there and, and try to get your voice amplified. Bonnie, I don't know if you or Kenny uh, had anything to say there, but I also had another question for Andronika here. I, I don't know if Kenny wanted to say, I was just going to sort of um, say what you just said there, Vanna. We, we kind of find it a fine balance between the cheesy and the like, we don't want to make light of the difficult lives that the folks we're advocating for are living. So it's a balance. It's all a balance. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to make a question for you. You mentioned earlier um, about taking people from ally to co-conspirator to an advocate. Um, could you- Oh, other way. Uh, yeah. Allies, accomplice, uh, co-conspirator. Oh, that question, who, okay, this question, I read it wrong here. I read it right, but I think the person got it wrong. How do you get people, how do you move people along that process in a practical way? So it's hard, right? And, and so first you've got to do the hard analysis because uh, particularly some of your closest and dearest board members, um, people you have deep relationships with, financially and going back years will fancy themselves co-conspirators, which is the highest and best use, right? And they're barely an ally, right? They're, and so you've got to have a really good assessment of where they are. And some people don't even make it onto the, onto the spectrum, right? They're just an observer. Uh, and you're like, wait a minute, this is someone we do all of this work with. And but when you look at the impact, when you look at um, your relationship with them, it, it's not really, um, it's not really there. I actually had to have a hard conversation with a partner and I told them y'all are not even a partner, you're a parasite. Uh, now, obviously you don't do that willy nilly. <laughs> and there, there's some, there's some deep issues that have happened there. There's real trust that has been broken, um, incredible problems. So you, you know, you do that cautiously and, and, and not cavalierly, but if it's gotten to that point, you've got to be clear. So that's the first piece is you got to have a clear assessment of where everybody is along the spectrum. And yeah, you want to move as many people as possible into co-conspirator because that's the folks who are going to have your back when it's hard. But also, this is also coming back to the serenity prayer where it makes sense, except where people are, right? If you know where someone is and you understand why I'm an ally, they're an ally and they can't move up to a co-conspirator, they can't move to accomplice, they can't move to co-conspirator, and you understand why, and you, you're okay with that. Now, if you see someone not willing to move, again, again, you, you gotta be okay with that. But if you see partners who really wanna take that leap, who really get what you're working at, and, and they wanna figure out how to get in the trenches with you, uh, that's a that's relationship building. The Kenneth early Kenny's earlier point. That is relationship building at its finest, right? Because and and you can do that with what really psyched out is that we got a couple, not many, but we got a couple policymakers and elected officials who we would call co-conspirators, right? And that takes a lot of work. That takes a lot of effort. That takes a lot of time. Uh, and so it's starting off assess everyone very clearly uh assess why they are where they are and then talk about who can move who wants to, and who most importantly who wants to move it, it 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 has to be something that you have to figure out how to articulate right you don't will you be my co-conspirator right is that <laughs> but you do make that offer you do say i want to get in deeper relationship with you and we do that all the time right but what you as the, as, as the advocate have to do is really get clear about what your needs are. And most importantly, what the work and the people you are serving need for, to, to, to get the, the, to get the honorar honorific of co-conspirator. And hold and, those and, lines. And I just want to chime in because those are all great points. Uh, and, and you kind of started walking down the line. I thought you were going to go there. But in building co-conspirators also understand the people 
their role in society and their co-conspirator actions may not be what you want them to be, right? So you don't you don't take your co-conspirators who are funding you in certain ways on the front line, right? You don't you, you, you just there are just certain things in how you are working with those co-conspirators because there are people who I would consider co-conspirators that never ever ever show up at any events that I do, rarely speak to me on the uh, you know. But I know behind the scenes where there's an opportunity to help champion my cause, they're doing it. So just it's about the also, impact. Huh? It's about the impact. They have impact. They have exactly. the right impact. Yeah. yeah. So I just want to make that that clear because I have people who say, well, Kenny, that person's not with me because they're like, that's not where that person needs to be in that space. Don't put them in that situation. So. I just wanted to bring that because you you were going down that path and you kind of yeah. I just wanted to throw that in there. No, but that is a great point, Kenny, because it it doesn't you got to know what it looks like, what you need, and what they can do. Absolutely, thank you both for that. This has been such a great conversation. I hate to get next steps and kind of wrap us up here. But before I do that, I, I'm going to pose a question for you all to think about and answer after I give next steps here. So the question is, it's for me, um, what's one thing that you would task any advocate to do today? So thinking about the folks in the audience, if you had one ask of them to walk away from this webinar with and ask for a task of them today, what would that be? So think about that as I as I kind of roll through next steps, and then I'll I'll open it up and and, and let you all answer that in a second. But as far as um, next steps, I want to share your contact information with everyone uh, on the on today's webinar. This has been an excellent conversation. If folks want to follow up with you all, I'm going to leave this up for a few seconds here. Let them screenshot it. Um, this will also be in our PowerPoint that we'll share out after the call. But if folks want to reach out to our speakers um, after this, then please uh, do so using their information there. Um, I also want to announce some winners. Um, the winner of last week's uh, last week's survey winner, the, the person that we drew from taking the survey from last week's uh, webinar was Jessica Perez Meta. I think that's how you say your last name, Jessica. Uh, if you're on the call, you'll get a small prize from Prosperity Now, so thank you for filling out last week's survey. This is also a reminder for you all to complete the survey following this webinar for a chance to win a small prize. I uh, also want to announce our Twitter winner for today. We always appreciate folks who are tweeting using our hashtag Camp Prosperity. Danielle Batista, Danielle, you are a friend of Prosperity Now. We know you, you are today's social media winner. Uh, please drop your um, email address into the chat. If not, I know we can pull your email address. Uh, but Danielle, thank you so much for joining us on Twitter, uh, for tweeting about today's webinar. Hopefully you all learned as much as I did. I mean, such gems were dropped. I took a bunch of notes here as you all were speaking from Bonnie earlier, talking about informing, inspiring, and influencing. I just love, I'm a process person. I just love the way you broke that down in terms of moving people along the spectrum. Um, Andronika, obviously getting comfortable with conflict that just spoke to my soul so much because I think it's a very necessary part of advocacy, particularly in today's time where, where things can be contentious and you don't necessarily want to meet force with force, but you kind of have to go in prepared to, to battle sometimes and prepare for conflict. Um, and then um, also thinking about, I think, Bonnie, you mentioned it earlier, um, letting the other person define what the relationship means for them when we're talking about uh, working with folks who are most impacted. Um, so just a great conversation. I really appreciate all of the perspectives today. Um, a couple of other next steps for folks on the phone before I turn it over to you all, my panelists, again, to talk about that one task. Again, I encourage folks to um, complete our follow-up survey. Let us know what you thought about this particular webinar, not Camp Prosperity as a whole, but this particular webinar. Uh, and then lastly, as I mentioned at the top of today's session, again, another reminder, um, to schedule and meet with your legislators by August 31st. Again, you can uh, enter, by doing so, you'll enter to win a complimentary registration to the amazing event that is Prosperity Summit, which happens every other year. Uh, it'll be back in Washington, D.C. this year, but you'll uh, win a, a complimentary registration to our conference um, and be announced as our, as our advocacy winner. So please, if you have not already done so, set up your meetings with your legislators 
meet with them and then fill out our meeting logger. That is the way that you enter the contest is by filling out every uh, field in our meeting logger, including notes. So make sure you do that. It can be a local legislator, it can be a state legislator, whoever you're comfortable with. We just want you to do something with what you've learned over these last three weeks, taking this information and utilizing it. And then a couple other things here, I want to invite you all to join our online advocacy center. Uh, the link for it should be in the chat there. Um, it's where you can, what I mentioned earlier, one click, uh, by click of a button, send an email to a legislator, call a legislator, tweet at them. You can schedule your meetings for your August meetings through our online advocacy center. It's free and open to our entire uh, community. So please take advantage of our online advocacy center. Uh, and then lastly, connect with our Prosperity Now networks. Um, like-minded individuals who are focused on things like affordable housing, our campaign for every kid's future, tax issues, financial security issues. We have working groups within our networks where you can go uh, and talk to your peers more, uh, getting access to information, access to Prosperity Now experts, all of the things. We invite you to join our Prosperity Now networks to stay connected uh, and to continue to get uh, information, to continue to learn about some of the, the issues that we're focused on here. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to our panelists. We only have about four minutes. So really quickly, um, last thing here, if you um, would task our advocates on the call with one thing today, what would that be? So whoever wants to kick it off, feel free to do so. Ladies first. Let's just go in order. <laughs> um, what I would uh, task everybody with is um, to do your own internal assessment. Um, pick one of the topics we had here today, something that you cared about, and figure out what ma why it matters to you and, and, and whether or not you want to figure out if you got allies, if you want to look at social media, if you want to get comfortable with conflict, if you want to talk about what's needed in your, in your community and how your partners are, are rolling. Um, sit down and have the hard conversation because if you're struggling, you're here because you know, it spoke to you, the topic spoke to you, imposter syndrome. And that means that you're worried about whether or not your place is the right one. So have that hard internal conversation, not on everything, just pick a topic, pick one of the topics we talked about today and drill down and spend some time thinking about you and your place in your work um, and, and, and come to some conclusions and then take some action. I'm gonna agree uh, with Ms. Morris. Uh, there was a lot of information shared in this session that that I learned, uh, and I'm sure there were the other sessions prior to this one, you you learned a lot of uh, good, valuable things. I, and I think it was on the first slide when we started and we kicked off. Anytime I attend any type of session, my goal is to get one thing that I can stick in my toolkit from the session. And I figure if I do 10 things every month, I'll get 10 new tools that I'll stick in my toolkit. So just take one thing. You may not, everything may not apply to you, uh, you may not agree with or you don't, may not think it's applicable to you, but there's one thing over these last three days that you've learned or that you've been exposed to. Take it, put it in your toolkit and, and start utilizing it. That's what I would, that's what I would advise. Awesome advice from both of you. Um, I would challenge folks to find someone who is experiencing the issue, an issue that you are advocating for change in, find someone who's closer to it than you are. I know you feel connected to what you're advocating for, but there's someone closer who's living it. Schedule some time with them. Don't go with an agenda. Just as Kenny was saying earlier, just listen, an open mind, listen to the reality of what people are facing. It'll make you a stronger advocate. Thank you. Absolutely, such a great way to end today's wonderful session. Thank you so much for our pan to our panelists for lending your expertise. Learned a lot, I took a bunch of notes and I'm sure folks on the call did as well. Um, again, there's your contact information. Um, please join our advocacy network, our uh, advocacy listserv, email listserv. We wanna keep the conversation going on social media and all the places. But to everyone, thank you so much for attending Camp Prosperity 2023 and I hope you all enjoyed it. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Vanna. Thank you. Thank you all.